Well, good morning. If you have a Bible, go ahead and open it up to Psalm 73. Psalm 73. This morning's message is titled, Trusting God's Goodness in the Midst of Doubt. Trusting God's Goodness in the Midst of Doubt. Um, I'm thankful for the opportunity, as always, to be in God's Word together. Um, this week, in preparing uh, for this morning, uh, God got in my business. He never does that to us, does He? He gets in the middle of our business, and uh, you know, you're, you're trying to do your everyday life, and you're trying to work on something, and you feel like God's working on you, and you're like, man, is, is He talking to me? And God's like, yes, I'm, I'm talking to you. That's been my week this week. And so, as you're hearing this message this morning, just keep the nugget in the back of your mind that pastors are people too, and that uh, we as people struggle just like you do. And so, just letting you into my world just a little bit this week. Um, so perhaps God can use what He's done in my life this week. Um, and so, this morning, uh, we're going to look at Psalm 73. So if you want to stand in the honor of reading God's Word together, and then we'll jump in. Psalm 73, a psalm of Asaph. God is indeed good to Israel, to the pure in heart. But as for me, my feet almost slipped. My steps nearly went astray, for I envied the arrogant. I saw the prosperity of the wicked. They have an easy time until they die, and their bodies are well fed. They are not in trouble like others. They are not afflicted like most people. Therefore, pride is their necklace, and violence covers them like a garment. Their eyes bulge out from fatness, their imaginations of their hearts run wild. They mock and speak maliciously. They arrogantly threaten oppression. They set their mouths against heaven and their tongues strut across the earth. Therefore, his people turn to them and drink in their overflowing words. The wicked say, how can God know? Does the Most High know everything? Look at them. The wicked, they are always at ease, and they increase their wealth. Did I purify my heart and wash my hands in innocence for nothing? For I am afflicted all day long and punished every morning. If I had decided to say these things aloud, I would have betrayed your people. And when I tried to understand all of this, it seemed hopeless until I entered God's sanctuary. Then I understood their destiny. Indeed, you put them in slippery places. You make them fall into ruin. How suddenly they become a desolation. They come to an end, swept away by terrors. Like one waking from a dream. Lord, when arising, you will despise their image. When I became embittered and my innermost being was wounded. I was stupid and didn't understand. I was an unthinking animal toward you. Yet I am always with you. You hold my right hand. You guide me with your counsel, and afterward you will take me up in glory. Who do I have in heaven but you? And I desire nothing on earth but you. My flesh and my heart may fail, but God is the strength of my heart, my portion forever. Those far from you will certainly perish. You destroy all who are unfaithful to you. But as for me, God's presence is my good. I have made the Lord God my refuge so I can tell 
about all you do. Pray with me. Father, thank you so much for your word. In a moment of honesty from Asaph, in a moment of honesty this morning as we come as your people in this place to worship your name, Lord, some of us may come into this room with doubts. Some of us may come into this room with a misunderstanding or, Lord, a misplaced envy of the world. Lord, help us to see your goodness this morning through your word. Open our eyes and our hearts to what you have for us this morning. Pray all of this in Jesus' name. Amen. You can be seated. So have you ever been so distracted in life that you almost made a critical error? We hear a lot about distracted driving or distracted this or that. We hear about distractions from coaches in the sports world. But have you ever personally almost made a critical error because of distraction? I'll share with you a personal story where I came close to a critical error. Right after we got home from Vietnam with Gracie, and you're in the first initial stages of sleep-deprived parenthood, you know, distraction, you, you make critical errors or you get close. So sleep-deprived, one morning after getting up two or three times in the night to get Gracie settled back down, you know, the next morning you shuffle. You don't even pick your feet up off the floor. You just shuffle into the kitchen because you're going to make your pot of coffee for the morning. So I make coffee. And at this point, Gracie was still taking a bottle for nutrition. And so I'm sitting there scooping formula. You know, by this point, you're, it's kind of old habit. Well, in the middle of all of this, making coffee, a making bottle, I was not particularly focused on what I was doing. And you're probably thinking, Randall, not difficult jobs, making a pot of coffee, making a bottle. Not, not hard. But this particular morning, it was hard. So I was making coffee, making bottle. And so I thought I was getting creamer to put in my coffee and when my conscious, when I came fully to, I woke up and I had cup of coffee, scoop of formula mix, and I was about to pour it in. Critical error avoided. Let me just tell you, that would have been really bad had I actually put it in there, mixed it up, and drank it. Then I really would have been awake at that point. So, distraction would have led to a critical error in my morning. The crisis was averted. But how many times do we do that in our lives? We lose focus on God. And we become consumed with what's around us. Asaph, the author of this psalm, finds himself in the throes of envy and doubt. And let me just pause just for a second before we actually jump into our points if you're a note taker. How good is it that God in His sovereignty allows us to see another human being's doubt and then God answers the doubt. God knows that we're human. He knows that we wrestle with things. He knows that we, he knows we'll doubt. And he even allows us to see this in the Psalms. I, I used to tell my students when I was in student ministry, if you want to read somebody's ancient diary and see openness and honesty, read the Psalms. Because sometimes you read them, you're like, wow, this is depressing stuff. Like this guy's really honest. Like, where are you, God? Like, what are you doing, God? And we've all, if we're honest, we've all been in places like that in our lives. And so I'm thankful that God is not in heaven above with His hands on His hips. Why are you doubting? 
but instead shows us, here is doubt, let me answer it. And he shows his goodness in that way. So if you're a note taker, the first thing I want you to see this morning is that the life of the wicked or the unrighteous looks simple and easy, and we can often envy them. The life of the wicked or the unrighteous looks simple and easy. And we, as Jesus followers, can often envy them. We look at the lives of the wicked around us and think how we wish that we could have it that easy. We see their prosperity and it drives us crazy. We see that they worship at the idol of self and seem to pay no consequence. Maybe a person you know that doesn't love the Lord wants nothing to do with Him. Maybe they get a brand new house or a brand new car. Suppose they get a raise and you don't. Suppose they get the promotion and you don't. And on the inside, that kind of drives us crazy. Maybe they got the promotion by cheating the system. And on the inside, we can feel just, you know, especially when we've been doing it the right way, that we think we've been doing it God's way, and it can drive us crazy. We think about in culture, We can envy the culture around us with the changing tide in culture, particularly our culture's views on marriage. We think about the change that is coming in our culture, but instead of praying to our God and obeying His Word, some of us have been tempted that politics could be the answer. Now, Hear me, I'm not saying that we shouldn't be good citizens, responsible citizens. Voting is a precious right given to us by God through our government. We have the freedom in this country to make our voices heard. But we should tread lightly in thinking that those efforts alone are what's going to save our culture. It is only God who can do that. So church, what do we envy this morning? Do we envy success? Do we envy wealth? Do we envy influence, control, comfort, We are fooling ourselves if we don't think that we're envying something in our lives. I'll give you a a story. When I was in college and seminary, I had a job. And this job, part of it was you had a base salary, and it was for the time back in the day in a college and seminary job, the salary was pretty good. Not the salary. The hourly rate was pretty good. And, uh, but there was also a production side of the job that you got a production bonus. Like if you achieved a certain level of production, it was this bonus. And the more production you had, the higher your bonus, and it would cap out like right here. This was like max bonus. And I was on a crew that like every month man, I would do exactly what they told us to do in training. And I would never make max bonus. And it would just drive me crazy. But there was a group of guys on our crew that made max bonus every month, like clockwork. And then after being there a while and having conversations, I realized that they were subverting the system and that they weren't being called out for it. And then when I said something, not in my own like like righteous indignation, like law and order, but like when I was like, hey guy, how are you doing this? 
Not that I was going to rat on them or anything, but I was like, how is this happening? And they're like, man, if you just did this, this, and this, you'll make max bonus every month. And in my heart, I'm like, well, that's not right. But then when I, after they told me how to do it and I still didn't do it, then they came back to me and they're like, are you an idiot? Like we told you how to make more money and you're not going to do it. And that used to just drive me crazy every month. Because then, you know, if it's a crew of six people or eight people and you look like you're like fifth or sixth on the production level, you look bad. And that used to drive me crazy. When I knew everybody in front of me, or most of them, were cheating their way to the top. And so it used to drive me crazy how they had it so easy. I was jealous, envious of their ease and their, the money that came with that ease. So what frustrates us in life? What can cause us to envy the wicked? The second thing I want us to see is envy actually distracts us from God and the truth of His Word, and that can cause doubt. Envy distracts us from God and the truth of His Word, which can cause doubt. When we succumb to the envy of our hearts, we lose focus, and we begin to doubt ourselves, and we begin to doubt God. We begin to question ourselves. Why do I try to Love God and be faithful to Him when all I see and experience is disappointment compared to them. The wicked that we see, the wicked that we often envy seem to have it all together. And we're over here trying to live out the commands of God in our lives and it is so hard. Asaph even says, did I, did I purify my heart and wash my hands in innocence for nothing? Like, hello, I've been doing exactly what you told me to do. Can you sense the, just the, the spirit of desperation and frustration? Our doubt comes from a lack of trust in the Lord. Tim Keller, a pastor in New York, has this quote. And this is what he said. Worry is not believing that God will get it right. And bitterness is believing that God got it wrong. Worry is not believing God will get it right. And bitterness believes that God got it wrong. When we are consumed by this doubt, we begin to think of ourselves and God unclearly. When we see how good they have it, we, we begin to question things like, what is true? Is God lying to us? Is He lying to me? Is He withholding things from me? And if this doubt is not corrected, if our mind is not renewed, this can be very dangerous. I had a mentor in seminary. He used to look at me and say, Randall, don't be a Demas. And I was like, who's Demas? And he's like, he's a, per he's a person in the Bible. And I'm like, Demas in the Bible? Like, what story was that? So if you read Paul's letters and he lists his entourage at the beginning and the end, Paul to the church at blah, 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 or Paul and Timothy, blah, blah, blah. And at the end of the letter, he's like, all of these people greet you in the Lord, Sylvanius and Timothy and Luke. And sometimes there was a, a name listed in there, Demas. Demas rolled with Paul. He was in Paul's missionary entourage. And yet, 2 Timothy what we believe 
is Paul's last letter in his lifetime, or one of his last letters in his lifetime. At the end of that letter, 2 Timothy chapter 4, verse 10, guess what Paul says? For Demas, he tells Timothy, come to me quickly. For Demas, having loved this present world, has deserted me and has gone to Thessalonica. What we know from Paul's writing is that Demas walked away from the faith. He deserted Paul at the end of his life and chased after the world. Paul was enduring his trial because of his eternal perspective. But Demas had left because of his worldly perspective. So Finchville, I'm forwarding it one step forward. Don't be a Demas. Don't be a Demas. Don't give up And don't chase the world. Don't give in to your doubt. It's not wrong to doubt. It's just wrong to let your doubt take control. But what if I told you that God could graciously pull you out of this envy and doubt just by His presence? The third thing I want us to see this morning is we are reminded of truth when we enter into His presence. Verse 16, it seems like Asaph turns on a dime. The first half of verse 16, when I tried to understand all of this, it seemed hopeless. When I'm trying to process all of this doubt and envy and the things of the world myself, It all seems hopeless. That's the first half of the verse. The second half of verse 16, actually the beginning of 17. The beginning of verse 17. It all seems hopeless until I entered God's sanctuary. Then I understood their destiny. Indeed, you've put them in slippery places. You make them fall into ruin. You see, God does not move in His faithfulness. He is always faithful. Jesus Christ is the same yesterday, today, tomorrow, and forever. Often when we feel distant from God, we are the ones who have moved We are the ones who have stepped away from Him. He is unchanging, but we can waver. But when we come to Him, our perspective is changed. That's why Asaph walks into the temple for corporate worship and his perspective changes. He's confronted with God's Word. And more than likely, He sings or hears singing that contains biblical truth. Asaph remembers the truth of his word. He remembers God's promises. He remembers the eternal instead of the temporary. When he enters God's promises, his perspective changes. He then, Asaph, experiences what Paul writes in Romans 12, 2, to not be conformed to the world, but to be transformed by the renewing of your mind so that you may prove what the will of God is, that which is good and acceptable and perfect. When we begin to remember the spiritual state of the wicked, we remember that they are destined for destruction without Christ. We remember that God is just that He is not mocked. We remember that He says, vengeance is mine. And we also remember that God causes rain to fall on the just and the unjust. It even changes our perspective to remember that they, the wicked, are people created in the image of God. 
but they have no relationship with Him. And then the truth sets in that how sad of a life that must be to not know your Creator personally. But if you are here today in Christ, you do. You know your Creator personally. Wow. If you think about social media, Facebook, and we see pictures, and we see people that we could be jealous of, we see that they look happy with all their stuff or the vacations that they go on, and we see their supposed happiness. But that's all we see. We don't see the whole picture. We just see what they want us to see. There's more to the story there. They have hurts. They have disappointments. And they probably took 20 tries to get that selfie just right. And their hurts and disappointments are worse because they have no one faithful like God to rest upon. They don't have the God to rest in like you do. So what about God's presence removes the fog? The last thing I want us to see this morning is that we are reminded by the truth that God is good to us and that He is all we need. God is good to us and we are reminded that He is all we need. Verse 21, Asaph says, When I became embittered, my innermost being was wounded. I was stupid and I didn't understand. I was an unthinking animal towards you. Yet, I'm always with you and you hold my right hand. We begin to remember how good we have it. We begin to think to ourselves that life in Christ is better when we remember the truth. We remember what Jesus did for us. We remember that He is all we really need. Asaph realizes at this point that intimacy with God is something that could never be traded away. Just like a father with a small child, he walks with us hand in hand through our lives. He is there. Even when we fail or we don't think clearly, he is there holding us faithfully by the hand. And like a faithful father of a small child that grows up, he guides us with his counsel. And He leads us through life by the hand to take us into glory with Him one day. What a picture. Compared with everything that the world can offer, who or what can compare to God? It's one of the greatest questions in the Bible. Who, have I ha- who do I have in heaven but you? Just like we heard from the book of Joshua, Choose this day who you will serve. And as for me and my house, we will serve the Lord. When presented with the choice, it now becomes crystal clear that it is really no choice at all. And Asaph remembers the core truth. Verse 26, My flesh and my heart may fail, but God is the strength of my heart and my portion forever. If we trust God, if we lean on Him and not ourselves and our own understanding, He will faithfully sustain us. He shows us His grace and His power through this life because He knows that we can't do it. Asaph says, My flesh and my heart may fail, 
But God is the strength of my heart and my portion forever. How good is God that He Himself is the strength we need and the satisfying portion in life that we need in order to live faithfully in a world that doesn't. And intimacy with God is for our good. Being near to Him is for our good. He becomes our refuge. We have hope and clarity through intimacy with Him. And we can trust Him more and more. When we get to a place like this, we can't help but worship and praise His name. And it also creates in us a desire to share the truth of what God has done for us. So that those in the world will abandon themselves and run into the presence of God to experience His goodness. So maybe you're here this morning and you have doubt in your life about who God is. I pray that this morning you see how good God is to you, that He answers the doubt. That this morning you can approach the throne and say, I believe, Lord, help me in my unbelief. Finchville, we as a church can be tempted to lose focus. But we must remember that we are God's covenant people. May we be reminded that God is surely good to His people. Maybe you're here this morning and you know that the deepest part of your heart, that all of the good things that you've heard, you don't have. Because you've never humbly come to His presence and repented of sin and asked for His forgiveness and asked for His Spirit to dwell in you. You can have that this morning. You can have this good God. If you're not walking in Him, the good news so far is that His grace has reigned over you. Because His reign falls on the just and the unjust. But you can be justified this morning through the person and the work of Jesus. You can have that this morning. In a minute, we're going to stand and sing. And whatever the Lord has laid on your heart, whatever your doubt is, this is the moment that we are here together, that we have walked into this place. And this is a beautiful sanctuary. But it's not the walls of mortar that we walk into and our perspective has changed. It's when we walk into this community of people sitting under His Word in His presence, that's when our perspective has changed. So what about your perspective needs to be changed this morning? What doubts do you need to bring before the Lord? You can come and pray right here, or I can pray with you. If you want to have a conversation about Christ as your Savior, I'd love to have that conversation. And maybe you're even interested in becoming a member of this church. I'd love to have that conversation as well. But whatever God is leading you to do, do it. Let's pray. Father, thank you so much for this morning. We thank you for your word that it's honest. That you honestly put before us Asaph's doubt. And Lord, you answer it and you show us your goodness. That you remind us of your truth from your word about who you are. That you are true, you are holy, you are good. And that we need you. Not only to correct our perspective, but we need you to walk with us by the hand through life. And Lord, that is the most precious thing that we could ever have 
And that even if our world falls apart, that it's not the way it should be. That it seems like those who don't even give a care in the world about you or who you are, your kingdom or your son, that it looks like their life is great. And Lord, even as we still struggle, Lord, remind us that having you is the treasure that we need to value. That knowing you is greater than having any riches in the world. Help us to remember that and cherish that. Lord, we thank you for your goodness to us. That even when we doubt, you come to us and you answer us as a good father. Whatever business you have in the hearts of people here this morning, I pray that you would do it now. That you would accomplish your will this morning. We pray all of this in Jesus' name. Amen. We're going to stand and sing together.